Hello there, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of hypothesis testing, but instead of focusing on the two-tailed or two-sided alternative hypotheses, we're going to be focusing on the one-tailed or one-sided alternative hypotheses. So let's just briefly review what we talked about last time. So last time, we were focused on the hypothesis that the mu was equal to something. Let's call it mu zero. And we were using a two-sided alternative that mu was not equal to mu zero. Let's just take a moment to actually look deeper into what the statement actually means. So this is equivalent to the statement mu is greater than mu zero or mu is less than mu zero. So as long as we have evidence in favor of either that one-sided alternative or that one-sided alternative, then we have evidence to believe that the null hypothesis is actually false or possibly misleading. So let's look at a pictorial representation of this because this is going to help us look into the one-tailed hypothesis. So let's look at the x-bar domain. So in the x-bar domain, we're going to have the mean in the center of our distribution, and we're going to have the boundaries of our confidence intervals x-bar minus epsilon and x-bar plus epsilon uh, on that graph. So the area, of course, between these values is always going to represent our level or region of confidence. So if we get a value that's close to x bar within some margin of error, then we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if it's beyond these boundaries, so if, for example, if the mu zero is over here, then we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. There's, of course, an equivalent perspective of this. For example, if we want to consider test statistics or p-values, so let's look at that and see what that looks like. So an equivalent picture, so let's look at the z-score for the x-bar domain, right? So this would be a standard normal distribution um, or a t-distribution, depending on if you know sigma or not. So let's actually assume that this is a normal. If this is normal, then this is going to be a normal with sigma. Uh, then this is going to be a uh, standard normal if we assume that sigma is known. So if we assume sigma is known, so the corresponding representations or values of x bar minus epsilon and x bar plus epsilon would be the critical values, which are used actually to calculate the uh, margin of error. So zero is gonna be in the middle of that. We're gonna have negative z critical value and positive z critical value there. Of course, there's some area that is corresponding to this picture, in particular this one. And keep in mind, this area is still equal to c. But keep in mind, if the mu zero is greater than x bar, that means x bar minus mu is going to be a negative number. So if we get a test statistic over here, right, so this is going to be our test statistic, or z stat, as some people would represent it, then we would, of course, reject the null hypothesis in that state. Keep in mind, this region and that region are equivalent perspectives, but these are, of course, reversed in terms of the perspective of the domain that we're considering these things in, right? So rejection on the right in the x-bar domain is the same as rejection in the test statistic world on the left. So let's just outline those conclusions um, just so you know that that is the case. So if mu zero is significantly greater than x bar, then that means that x bar minus mu zero is significantly less than zero. If that is the case, then we have that the test statistic, z stat, uh, should be less than or equal to zero, which would give us the scenario that we would reject the null hypothesis. Similarly, if the uh, claim of the value of mean is significantly less than the average that we obtain, then that means the average minus the claim should be significantly greater than zero. If that is the case, that means the test statistic is also going to be significantly greater than zero. If we're working in our two-tailed world, then we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. And the complement of these conclusions, if mu zero is approximately equal to our point estimate for mu, then that means the z test statistic is going to be approximately equal to zero. And that, of course, gives us conclusion that we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. So that would be the summary of our two-tailed test conclusions. So two-tailed test conclusions. 
So now let us take a moment and see how these things would change if we were to switch into a one-tailed alternative. So first scenario, let's assume that the null hypothesis is again that mu is equal to something. But instead of doing mu is not equal to something, let's see how the world would change if mu is greater than mu0 is chosen to be the alternative hypothesis. So let's take a moment and interpret what this means in terms of what we're testing and what we're going to be accepting. So this means what? That means if x bar is significantly greater than mu0, then we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. Keep in mind if x bar is significantly greater than mu0, that means x bar minus mu0 is significantly greater than 0. That of course means that the test statistic is going to be significantly greater than 0 in life as well. Keep in mind if x bar is significantly greater than mu0, that means mu0 is significantly less than x bar. So these are of course equivalent things, just reversed. So let's actually look at the pictorial representations of these uh, so we know what we're actually looking at here. So let's first off look at things in the x bar domain, and then we're going to be looking things, looking at things in the z score for the x bar domain. Again, we're going to be assuming that this is normal with a sigma known. Uh, that would imply that this is going to be a standard normal or a z distribution uh, if that is the case. Again, if we do not know sigma, then this other distribution will be a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So what do we want? So keep in mind, let's draw some little boundaries here. So this is going to be x bar, uh, x bar minus epsilon and x bar plus epsilon. Um, but actually only one of these things is gonna be useful to us. So x bar minus epsilon, x bar plus epsilon. Now we're, notice we're only going to be rejecting the null hypothesis if this particular scenario is true. That is the claim is significantly less than x bar. That is located in this regime. So that means the region of confidence is actually not going to be in the center, but it's actually going to be corresponding to this particular picture. That means the region of confidence is only bounded by this particular boundary. So that means the confidence interval looks something like x bar minus epsilon up to positive infinity, assuming that we do not truncate the domain. So if this is the particular case, what would the z-score for the x bar domain be? So as usual, this is going to be zero. That's the position of the negative z critical value and the positive z critical value. Remember that the x bar domain picture and the z x bar picture are going to be reversed because if the claim value is down here, that means the test statistic is gonna be in the positive regime because if x bar is greater than mu zero, that means x bar minus mu zero is a positive number. If that is the case, that means the upper boundary is gonna be here. So that's gonna be our positive z critical value and therefore our region of confidence is going to be in the lower tail of that distribution. Therefore, if you get a mu zero down here, you're gonna be rejecting something. If you get a test statistic z stat in the upper spectrum, then you're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis in an equivalent manner. Therefore, keep in mind that these pictures are equivalent and they should be used uh, accordingly in terms of your interpretations. So this is going to be the confidence interval perspective and that's gonna be your test statistic perspective. So let's just summarize the test statistic perspective. So therefore, if the test statistic, which should be positive, if it's negative, then we're gonna be failing to reject because it doesn't really matter how close it is to zero on the negative end, we're gonna be failing to reject because we're not accepting any negative Z statistics in terms of rejection. So the test statistic, if that is greater than the Z critical value, then we will be rejecting the null hypothesis now again, this sometimes gets a little bit complicated, so p-values definitely have an advantage in terms of interpretations here, because again, we're still gonna be looking at p-values less than alpha um, in order to reject the null hypothesis. So, so that doesn't really change, um, but the confidence intervals and the test statistics do. So that of course poses another advantage of p-values in terms of it, uh, calculations and interpretations, i.e. it is consistent regardless if it's one-tailed or two-tailed. But there is a big difference on how we calculate the p-value though, right? Because if this is our test statistic, then the probability of getting it or something better in favor of the alternative is going to be that right-tailed area shaded in green. So that means the, prob the probability of obtaining our test statistic or something greater in favor of the alternative. And you may think, well, why is it in favor of the, al favor of the alternative? Notice that these areas are going in the same exact direction. 
That's why these pictures should be reversed. So that means the p-value should just be equal to the integral of the z test statistic up to infinity of, let's assume that this is a normal distribution, so that's going to be f z of x dx. So that means this is not going to be a two times integral because it's not a two-tailed test. Right? So that's going to be our p-value for our one-sided alternative. And some people will call this a right-tailed test or a left-tailed test. It really depends on the perspective because these pictures are reversed. So it really depends on which one you are looking for. So usually in terms of interpretations of how you would go about this is primarily dictated by the actual statement that is in your alternative hypothesis. So this alternative generates these two pictures. So how does this look like if we change the direction? So let's just take a moment and look at that. So again, let's assume that the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to mu zero. For, all our, for our alternative, we're going to assume that mu is actually less than mu zero. So what would this be looking like? So let's just briefly interpret it so we get our pictures uh, in the right direction. So for example, if x bar is significantly less than mu zero, then we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. So if x bar is significantly less than mu zero, that means x bar minus mu zero is going to be significantly less than zero. If that is the case, that means the z test statistic is also going to be significantly less than zero. Therefore, from these two pictures, x bar is significantly less than mu zero, and z test statistic is less than mu, of course, uh, creates your, not mu, should be zero, um, creates the pictures that you're going to be looking for because in all these scenarios, we will be rejecting the null hypothesis. So let's take a look at uh, the x bar domain and see what that looks like. So x bar domain is gonna have x bar in the middle, x bar plus epsilon, x bar minus epsilon. But keep in mind, x bar being significantly less than mu zero means that mu zero is significantly greater than x bar. So that means our mu zero should be up here in case we want to reject it. So that means our shaded area is going to be this particular region. So this is going to be our region of confidence C. And our rejection region is going to be up here in the upper tail. So if we convert this into the z-score domain, so let's assume that this is a normal distribution with sigma known. Uh, that means this is going to be a z distribution. So that means our lower boundary for our confidence interval is going to be down here. And therefore our region of confidence is going to correspond to that particular picture. Um, so uh, for our confidence intervals, this is going to be x bar plus epsilon. So our confidence interval should look something like minus infinity to x bar plus epsilon uh, for our CI. And our test statistic, if mu zero is in the upper tail, that means our test statistic, let's call it a z test statistic, is going to be in the lower spectrum. And that means the p-value is going to be the area to the left of that particular region. So let's just summarize those uh, conclusions just to have it in writing. So that means if the z test statistic is less than the negative z critical value, that's going to imply rejection of the null hypothesis. And similarly, if p value is less than alpha, our type one error probability that we usually control, then of course we would also be rejecting the null hypothesis where the p value is calculated as the integral from minus infinity up to our z test statistic, which, which should be negative if we're rejecting it, of the distribution of interest uh, with respect to its variable. So that's how you calculate p-values, uh, test statistics, and construct confidence intervals in the one-tailed world. Now let us take a look at a couple examples. Let's assume that we're interested in testing the claim that the mean blood pressure of a particular population is 121 millimeters of mercury. And let's assume that we choose to use the alternative that the mean blood pressure of this population is actually significantly greater than 121. You would use this alternative if you highly believe that uh, hypertension is an issue in your population. So what are you going to do? You're going to go out and select a sample from that normally distributed population, let's assume, and let's assume that you do not want to uh, reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true, on average 3% of the time, so our type 1 error. So let's assume uh, under these assumptions, after you gather your sample, you obtain a sample size of 23, a sample mean of 124.5, and a sample standard deviation of 3.4. If your goal is to reject, your hope is that this point estimate is significantly greater than 1.1, that is in the same exact direction as your alternative. So let's just take a look on how we would analyze uh, this particular scenario 
and construct our confidence intervals, test statistics, and p values. So what do we know? So notice that sigma is unknown in this particular picture, so we can't use our z distribution. Therefore, we need to use our t distribution, uh, where our degrees of freedom v, which is m minus 1, is going to be equal to 23 minus 1, which is going to be 22. Right? So therefore, we're going to be using a t22 distribution uh, for our p-value calculations and the shapes of our graphs that we're going to be graphing, which is relatively similar to the normal, just wider tails. So what, are, what would our pictures look like? So in the x-bar domain, so x-bar there, x-bar minus epsilon, x-bar plus epsilon there, we want our area shading in the same direction as our alternative. That means our area for C should be corresponding to that. So that means this value in the lower spectrum, x-bar minus epsilon, is going to correspond to some number in the z-score for x-bar spectrum. So which one is it? The lower one or the upper one? So again, this is going to be equal to zero. So this is going to be the x-bar domain, and that means this is going to be the t22 domain. So of course, what is going to be our boundaries? So that means this is going to be an upper boundary. So that's going to be our t critical value, where this area to the left of that t critical value is again going to be equal to c. So this t critical value is going to correspond to the c percentile of t22. And then we can find that in our usual way. So for example, if you're in Excel, that's just going to be equal to t.imv of c comma v. So what is that going to come out to? So that means uh, that t critical value uh, with uh, 22 degrees of freedom will come out to approximately 1.9829. Once we have our t critical value, then we can calculate our standard error of the estimate for x bar. So SEX bar, again, is going to be equal to S divided by the square root of N, since sigma is not known. That's going to be approximately equal to 0 0.7089. Once we have our T critical value and our standard error of the estimate, that means our margin of error, which again is going to be our T critical value times the standard error of the estimate. Once we multiply those two numbers, you're going to have approximately equal to 1.4058. Once you have these three objects, from there we can calculate our confidence interval. So the confidence interval for our population mean mu under a level of confidence of 97%, because our alpha, remember, was 3%, is going to be equal to, so since this is our confidence interval, it's going to be of the form x bar minus epsilon up to infinity. So that means once we actually go through those calculations for x bar, which is given, and epsilon, which we have, that's going to be approximately equal to 123.09 to infinity. So that is going to be our 97% one-sided or uh, right-tailed, I guess you could say, uh, confidence interval. So once we have that, that means we can calculate our test statistic. So our test statistic, t stat, remember was equal to the square root of n times x bar minus the claim value of mu all divided by the standard deviation of the sample. Once we actually go through those calculations, that's going to be 4.9369 which is subjectively far from zero. We'll see if it's far enough. That means the p-value is going to be equal to the integral of the t-test statistic up to infinity of the t22 distribution. And one can find that that's approximately equal to 3.069 times 10 to the power of 95. Right, so that's relatively close to zero. So let's conclude this alternative, this hypothesis test under all three methods of hypothesis testing. So 121, which was the claimed value, uh, does not belong to our confidence interval. Our test statistic, t stat, is greater than our t critical value, and our p value is less than our alpha value of 0 0.03. Therefore, since all of these, which are always going to be equivalent, uh, satisfy our rejection criteria, that means we have evidence to believe that the null hypothesis is false. Therefore, we will reject the null hypothesis. So one could ask, what are the advantages or disadvantages of choosing a one-tailed or one-sided alternative hypothesis over a two-sided or two-tailed alternative hypothesis? So let's actually go through that uh, exploration to sort of see what the answer is in terms of type 2 error and statistical power. So let's just briefly review those terms just to make sure that we know what we're talking about. 
So recall that beta is the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. And statistical power, or the complement of beta, is going to be the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, provided again that the null hypothesis is false. And again, remember the only time we can actually say that the null hypothesis is false is actually if we know the parameters of the distribution that we're talking about. So some very important properties that we should already know about this. So as the probability of committing a type 1 error uh, increases, so not necessarily a good thing because you're um, rejecting something that is true, um, but uh, there's a worse scenario uh, usually that we frame hypothesis testing in, and that's from type uh, 2 error. So as alpha type 1 error increases, then the type 2 error, beta, will usually decrease, which is actually a really good thing. So if beta decreases, that means beta, uh, pi, its complement, will also increase as well. So this principle is usually what we like in the realm of hypothesis testing. So make alpha a little bit big, so that's why we usually don't make alpha zero. So that's why, you know, 5% for alpha, 10% for alpha, that's usually okay. That will make the type 2 error a little bit smaller than usual, which is actually a very, very, very good thing. So let's see how the type 1 and type 2 error for two versus one-sided hypothesis tests actually compared to each other. So let's actually draw a picture uh, so we can get a area or geometry perspective of these things. So let's assume that this is our x-bar distribution. So let's do our uh, x-bar minus epsilon and x-bar plus epsilon. So this is going to be the null hypothesis that mu equals mu zero, two-sided alternative, mu does not equal to mu zero. Um, so that means this region here uh, is going to correspond to our level of confidence, right? So that is C. And let's assume that this is our by default null hypothesis true distribution. So we're going to be drawing another distribution here. So that's going to be the true distribution. So that's H0 false. So again, this is centered around mu and has some standard deviation sigma, right? So let's assume that's normal. So this area here shaded in red. Let's actually make that tail a little bit more wider so it's a little bit more obvious what I'm shading here. Um, so that means this area between x bar minus epsilon and x bar plus epsilon with respect to the blue distribution, this is beta, right? And the complement of that, which is chilling uh, in that lower tail there, and the big upper tail there, so that's a uh, pi right hand side and that's power left hand side, right? So what will happen when I shift it to the one tail? Do you think that a type two error will increase or decrease? Do you think the statistical power will increase or decrease? Now let's just briefly talk about something before we actually go into this, this sketch, right? So let's assume um, we're working with a 80% level of confidence. So if this is 80%, then this point up here is again, not the 80th percentile, right? because uh, 40 is going to be chilling here, 40 is going to be chilling here, 20% is going to be in the tails, that means 10% is going to be in the lower tail too, right? So that means this value corresponds to the 90th percentile. If we look at the one-sided uh, distribution with the same exact level of confidence, so if this is 80%, then that means this is, of course, going to be the 80th percentile, right? So notice that for the one-tailed test, this value which usually corresponds to x bar plus epsilon, and this value also, which also corresponds to x bar plus epsilon, are not at the same exact position. So actually for the one-sided alternatives, the x bar plus epsilon is actually less than the x bar plus epsilon for the um, two-sided symmetric hypothesis test. So that's very, very important. So let's keep that in mind when we sketch the graph of our next picture. Right? So let's just delete this um, so we can sort of keep both pictures on the same exact world so we can compare. And let's see if I can replicate the shapes of both of those distributions as well. That's, that's going to be a fun exercise. Right, so there's our uh, null hypothesis true distribution. Let's see if we can grab that blue distribution as well. So kind of wide there. Yeah, it's not too bad. Um, so again, x bar is going to be the center of that distribution. And x bar plus epsilon, let's draw it right here uh, because we already know for a one-tailed hypothesis test, so again, this area 
corresponds to our region C, right? So is our type two error going to be larger or smaller than it used to be? So our type two error is gonna be this little tail here. So clearly um, the area in this little region here between X bar and X bar plus epsilon is definitely less than it used to be. Um, and it covers the same amount on the right hand side. That's obvious. So one needs to ask yourselves, is this tail area more than or equal to the area that's missing in the old picture? And the answer is no. One can algebraically verify that that is the case, usually. It really depends on this picture. But typically, beta, at least for the normal distribution, the t-distribution case, usually decreases when you actually go through that calculation. And in terms of the statistical power, we're actually going to be covering more area than before. So, of course, one needs to argue that this area here is greater than or equal to the area in that tail. Typically, um, is the case for the normal distribution, t distribution, but it really depends on the distribution. But generally speaking, beta decreases for one sided alternative hypotheses and statistical power increases for one-sided alternative hypotheses. But it just doesn't increase. It only increases in one direction. It only increases in favor of the alternative hypothesis, right? So keep in mind for the test statistic perspective, it's in the other direction. So the purple area actually is shaded in the green direction once we convert into the z-score realm, right? So remember that those usually coincide with each other. So one can say that the statistical power increases in favor of the alternative hypothesis, but we lost any ability to detect validity in the other direction. That is in the other direction of the alternative hypothesis. That is, if mu is actually greater than mu zero, we generally we generally won't be able to see it. Right? So yes, you get statistical power in favor of the alternative, but you lose any uh, ability to detect um, truth in the opposite direction. So that's a pro, pro and a con of one-sided hypothesis testing. But generally speaking, when you do go with uh, one-sided versus two-sided, the type two error generally decreases. It doesn't increase or decrease that much, um, but there's definitely some difference between these two and you definitely should be aware of it. So if it significantly increases, then that's probably a bad thing. Um, but if it decreases, then that's a necessarily good thing. And if it really depends on the shape, well, maybe we should be calculating the type two error um, for both of the scenarios and seeing which actually is more advantageous, maybe, um, in terms of what we should do and what we should choose. So the next question is actually going to address this particular question. So is it possible to actually calculate the value of the type one, type two error beta and the level or the statistical power pi? The answer is yes, as long as the parameters in the distribution of what we're studying are known, right? So that's a slight little caveat. So example, let us suppose that the population is normally distributed and we gather a sample from it. Let's assume that mu is unknown to us at the present time. And let's assume that the standard deviation sigma is known to be 5.7. So that's a good thing. So let's assume that alpha is gonna be 0.08. The reason we're choosing alpha to be a little higher than 5% is because we want the type two error to be hopefully slightly a little bit smaller. So the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 52. The alternative is that mu does not equal to 52. So let's do a two-sided alternative just to uh, remember how to do that. And let's assume that the sample has the following characteristics. N is equal to 32. X bar is equal to 48. 
standard deviation 3.8. So let's look at our picture. What does it look like? So if this is in the Z realm, so this is going to be C, this is going to be a Z, that's going to be a Z critical value. So hopefully, larger alpha, smaller beta. That's the goal. And usually is true for normal distributions. Not necessarily true for all. Or not significantly different. So since sigma is known to us, that means we're going to be calculating a Z critical value approximately equal to uh, 1.7507. It's supposed to be an approximately equal to sign. Once we have our Z critical value, then we're going to calculate our standard error of the estimate for X bar. So that's going to be sigma divided by the square root of N, approximately equal to 1.0076. Then we can calculate our margin of error, 1.7640. And then we can calculate our confidence interval, which is going to be equal to X bar minus epsilon, X bar plus epsilon for our two-sided world. So that means the confidence interval, 92%, for population mean mu, it's going to be approximately equal to 46.24, 49.76. So if this is our confidence interval, and that is our claim, that means we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis because 52 is outside of that region. Now, we could be failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true, and we could be rejecting it when it's actually false, or rejecting it when it's true, or failing to reject it when it is false, right? So we need to make sure that we understand each of those four definitions first off. But what is actually the probability of committing a type 1 error and a type 2 error and pi, pi and confidence for these things? So we actually already know what alpha is. Alpha is just going to be 8%, so that's the probability of committing a type 1 error. Confidence is, of course, 92%. That's the probability of failing to reject something that is true. But what about pi and beta? How do we calculate them? So let's suppose that the actual distribution, so suppose the population, again, is normally distributed, we haven't changed that assumption, but we actually know what the value of mu is, 53, and sigma was given to be 5.7. So keep in mind, our decision criteria is entirely dictated by the confidence interval boundaries, assuming that we're actually con uh, concluding hypothesis tests from that perspective. So let's look at a picture. So x bar, 48, x bar minus epsilon, x bar plus epsilon is chilling there. There's our failing to reject region of C. And then our true value, 53, is hanging out above it, right? So 53, that's mu. And then this region here, shaded in orange, let's actually do a different color distribution so we get our, our curve straight. So there's our true distribution because it's clearly false, right? Because the mu is definitely not equal to 52, it's actually equal to 53. And it also assumes a couple other things about the population that it doesn't necessarily mention. So our type two error is this area, including that little piece up there, don't forget that, right? So our type two error, beta, is gonna be equal to the integral from x bar minus epsilon uh, to x bar plus epsilon of the distribution for x, right? So that's going to be equal to the distribution of x dx, right? So what is this distribution that we're integrating over? This is going to be a normal PDF with mu is equal to 53, sigma is equal to 5.7. Once you actually execute that calculation, that's going to come out to approximately 0.1674. And from here, we can find that pi, which is 1 minus beta, is approximately equal to 0 0.8326. So that's how we would actually go about calculating the probability of committing a type 2 error and the calculation of the statistical power of the hypothesis test. Keep in mind, we want that to be as large as possible and that to be as low as possible, provided that we're actually rejecting the null hypothesis as our goal. Now, I leave it to the reader to sort of you know explore what happens when we make uh, C a little bit bigger, C a little bit smaller, um, change our values, change our parameters, change our distribution even, and what actually happens to this type 2 error? Does it increase, decrease in the general scenario, or so on? Anyway, there's lots of things that you can explore here, but that's just an introduction to statistical power and how one-sided hypotheses tests actually influence it. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video 
when we begin to talk about how to do hypothesis tests for other parameters besides the mean. Take care.